Good afternoon and welcome to the thousandth episode of The Angry Astronaut. Just a couple days ago, one of my supporters let me know that I was going to be hitting this historic milestone. I actually had no idea that that was going to be happening, so I decided to do something special to talk about an amazing discovery that's been made very close to our own solar system. Before I get into that, though, I'd like to explain how I've managed to hit a thousand episodes in less than three and a half years. And one of the reasons, of course, is that I cover a lot of topics, as most of you know, and there's always new stories to be covered. Want to make sure that I cover them well. But there are other reasons as well. And if you're not interested in all of this, then please skip to here. YouTube has been a lot less generous with monetization, as I've mentioned a number of times over the years. And as a matter of fact, I've been making less money recently than I made when I had a third of the subscribers that I did during the pandemic. They just pay a lot less for advertising dollars. As a result, I've pretty much had to release content almost every single day in order to keep up with all of my financial needs. Once again, that's not your problem problem, but if this is something you'd like to help out with, there are ways to do it without having to pay any money whatsoever. First of all, just hit that notification bell. You'll find out about every video that I release, and then if you have the time to spare, please watch the video and watch it from beginning to end. If you abandon a video early on, YouTube holds that against you and they promote it less aggressively, especially right now. They've been doing that a hell of a lot. That's one way. Number two, of course, is just to watch my content as often as you possibly can. That's the sort of thing that's really going to help my channel out more than anything else. If I just got 50% more views than I get currently, my problems would largely be over. However, if you'd like to help out in any other way, well, there are methods in the description that you can follow. One of the most useful, in my opinion, would just to be to become a Patreon supporter. If I had 1% of my subscribers supporting this channel at a $5 level on Patreon, and there's all kinds of benefits that come with that, just 1%, again, Again, my problems would largely be over. Okay, enough talk about the promotion of this channel. Let me end by simply saying that I really appreciate all of your support. I appreciate how loyal you've been watching this channel. I am very grateful to all of the new viewers that I've had lately. And rest assured, no matter what happens to the angry astronaut, I'm going to keep piling out this content at the same level of quality or better as time goes on. And you're going to be every bit as pleased, I hope, with the next thousand episodes of The Angry Astronaut as you were with the first thousand. Now let's get on to this amazing discovery that's been made recently. The whole notion that we may very well have an Earth-like planet just over four light years away from our own. And also you may have noticed that Elon Musk has been interested in this planet, interested in the idea of going there. And as impossible as it might seem to traverse over four light years worth of space with the technology that we have had at our disposal for the last half century, if we had embarked on an interstellar journey back at the time when we really could have done this sort of thing, we would be receiving the first signal right now. And if you don't believe that, well, keep watching and I'm going to prove it to you in just a moment.
4.2 light years away, just a tiny hop by galactic standards lies Proxima Centauri, part of a trinary star system, and a lot of you may have heard about this famous planet Proxima b. What's especially interesting about this recent discovery is the fact that Proxima b now looks like an extremely habitable place, in spite of all the evidence that's been gathered to the contrary in the past. Even though Proxima b lies in a perfect region of space, at least as far as the Goldilocks zone, so to speak, of its star is concerned, there are many other things about this planet that make it seem less than hospitable. For one thing, it orbits its star extremely close. Now, this isn't a big problem as far as temperature is concerned, because Proxima Centauri is a small red dwarf star and generates far less heat than our sun does. But still, it is extremely close, 0.049 astronomical units, or over 20 times closer to the star than Earth is to the sun. What this means is, first of all, it orbits Proxima Centauri every 11.2 Earth days, and most importantly, it is tidally locked, meaning that one side of the planet constantly faces its star, and the other side of the planet is cloaked in eternal blackness. This would seem to make Proxima b completely uninhabitable. One side of the planet would be constantly bathed in heat and light from its star, the other side of the planet would be perpetually iced over. And it gets even worse than that. Red dwarf stars, at least early on in their lifespans, tend to flare up on a regular basis, and Proxima Centauri is no exception. And when this star flares up, it hammers the planet with a substantial amount of UV radiation, something that would make the development of life extremely unlikely and also quite possibly strip the planet's atmosphere away. Or so it was previously believed. Now, now, this seems to no longer be the case. A team of researchers at the NASA Goddard Institute utilizing climate simulations very similar to the ones that we use to study climate change have found some amazing results with every simulation that they have run on the potential climate of Proxima b in spite of these strange circumstances that make this planet so different from ours and yet so similar. Quote, we have shown that with a dynamic ocean, a hypothetical ocean-covered Proxima Centauri b with an atmosphere similar to modern Earth's can have a habitable climate with a broad region of open ocean extending to the night side at low latitude attitudes. Now, it's worth noting that all of the rocky planets in our solar system, with the possible exception of Mercury, were subjected to an ice bombardment in their past. That is to say, comets slamming into the planets in the early stage of their development, delivering a large amount of water. Venus, Earth, and Mars all experienced similar development, and as a result, all of these planets had massive oceans at different times during their history. If this was to happen with Proxima b as well, and there's every reason to believe that that is the case, a very dynamic ocean would have developed that would transport heat from one side of the planet to the other. In 18 different simulations, the researchers discovered that Proxima b ended up being a habitable planet in 17 of the different scenarios depending on the size of the ocean, the salinity of the ocean, and the ratio of water compared to dry land. But in almost all circumstances, the planetary temperature and the amount of surface liquid water ended up equalizing even on the night side of the planet. There were many regions of the night side of Proxima b that still ended up being very cold, but nevertheless liquid water. Areas that never saw any sunlight whatsoever would still have liquid water on its surface because of these extreme powerful ocean currents delivered by 
by the unique climate experienced by a tidally locked planet. But what about the regular bursts of radiation from a red dwarf star? Wouldn't that at least prevent the development of any sort of significant life? Well, with a very large and deep dynamic ocean comes a large amount of radiation protection. If you have one to 200 meters worth of water between you and stellar radiation and a pretty thick atmosphere to go along with it, this would provide adequate protection for any life developing deep in the oceans. And as this life developed and began to migrate further towards the surface, it's also conceivable that these various types of life would develop a much greater resistance to radiation, similar to the way that scorpions, ants, and cockroaches do here on our own planet. And there are other ways that life could adapt to the presence of regular radiation flares. For example, during the time of a flare, of course, the light would increase in intensity during these periods, and life that would survive might adapt to this situation by taking cover every time they saw the sun get brighter, simply taking cover in caves or deeper in the ocean, or perhaps just burying themselves in the mud. The thing that's so exciting about all of these new simulations that this team, by the way, has been working with since the publication of their first studies back in 2018 is the fact that under a wide variety of circumstances, Proxima B ends up being habitable in nearly all of them. If Proxima B received a large amount of water during the early stage of its development, as nearly every rocky planet in our solar system did, and by the way, we've observed lots of water in other solar systems as well, there's every reason to believe that we have a much more habitable planet than any of the other planets in our own solar system sitting right on our doorstep. Of course, 4.2 light years is not exactly on our front doorstep. This is trillions and trillions of miles. So how the hell do we traverse this kind of distance, especially using our current technology? Well, believe it or not, Project Orion back in the 1950s was setting about doing just that, using hydrogen bombs to accomplish rapid transport between stars as opposed to destroying our planet in a thermonuclear war. And if Project Orion had been carried through to its logical conclusion, we could have had a practical interstellar ship by 1980 at the latest, assuming that we put the same amount of effort behind this project as we put behind the effort to put a man on the moon. Think about that for a moment. The ability to travel between stars over 40 years ago. But how would this be possible? Possible. Well, the principles of Orion are actually very straightforward. Detonating small thermonuclear devices behind your ship and absorbing a great amount of the energy by means of a pressure plate and shock absorbers. That's about the simplest way to put it. The pressure plate absorbs the energy from the ther thermonuclear blast and the shock absorbers transfers the energy to the ship itself, accelerating it as much much as you need to accelerate it, assuming that you don't have a human crew on board, and within 36 days, a constant acceleration of 1G, you would reach 10% of the speed of light, which is about the maximum speed that a ship like this could attain before it ran out of thermonuclear bombs. Of course, it would also require enough nuclear devices to decelerate upon arrival, so utilizing this very crude and yet straightforward method of getting to 10% of the speed of light, this would bring Proxima B within striking range, allowing us to reach it within about 44 years. Now, of course, you'd probably have an unmanned ship accomplishing that, and if that were indeed the case, by 2024, Orion could have arrived at Proxima B and started transmitting signals back 
back to Earth. To paraphrase Carl Sagan, this is the most useful application of nuclear weapons that I can think of. And yet, this is not the only way of getting up to this kind of velocity. You could actually achieve as much as 20% of the speed of light utilizing a system called Breakthrough Starshot, an idea that would require a lot more investment of technology and money, but would allow 20% of the speed of light to be attained by a number of small probes, in other words, CubeSats. So we're not looking at old technology here, but rather technology we have at our disposal today. If you had a large multi-gigawatt laser array pushing a large number of solar sails, each of which would have a CubeSat in tow, you would want a large number of these probes because you'd probably have a high rate of failure as these probes were accelerated up to relativistic speeds, but the advantage would be you could reach Proxima B in about 20 years as opposed to more than four decades. However, these probes would be unable to slow down, so they would execute a quick flyby mission to Proxima B, gathering as much intelligence as they possibly could about the planet, and if things looked very attractive, then we might start seriously thinking about going there with human beings, and that would be an endeavor for the ages, because anybody who went to Proxima B would be very unlikely to return again. Unless, of course, human lifespans are extended considerably at some point in the future. But believe it or not, we have technology right now with the potential of getting us to Proxima B in a little bit more than a decade. And before you start scoffing, I'd like to direct you to Pulsar Fusion. Yeah, Fusion, the power source that's always 20 years away, but the good thing about fusion propulsion is that you don't need fusion power in order to get fusion propulsion. How does this work? Well, let me try to explain. The problem with fusion power is you need to put a tremendous amount of energy into a fusion power plant in order to produce the necessary plasma to get power back out. And to get a positive reaction out of this system is a very difficult thing to do. But what if all you needed was the plasma, not the power that came with it? Because high energy plasma travels at a tremendous velocity, actually a substantial percentage of the speed of light. You then contain the plasma utilizing barium copper oxide superconducting magnets, which allows for smaller, faster, and less expensive fusion chamber designs. Once you have the plasma contained, you can direct the plasma out the back of your rocket, utilizing the same electromagnetic forces that you used in order to contain the plasma in the first place. And as I mentioned before, we're talking about exhaust that's traveling at a substantial substantial percentage of the speed of light, meaning that a pulsar fusion system or something similar to it could potentially drive an interstellar ship up to about 35% of the speed of light, allowing you to reach Proxima Centauri in a little over a decade. But how would this work? This is a little bit more complicated than what we've been talking about before. Well, first of all, something like this would need to be constructed in orbit. So you would have your components of the rocket transported into orbit, perhaps via something like Starship, and then maneuver the components together utilizing ion engines. And by the way, Pulsar builds ion engines as well. Once you get the components assembled, you begin generating the plasma utilizing a fusion reaction. And keep in mind, we have created high energy plasma already with existing systems, and then the high energy plasma is pushed out the back of the rocket via electromagnetic forces and off you go to Proxima Centauri. Although, as I said before, it would take a little bit more than a decade and you would be unlikely to return within your lifespan, which means we would want to make damn sure that Proxima B is really as habitable as we think it is. But thus far, it seems that this planet, just on our cosmic back doorstep, looks a lot more promising than either Mars, Venus, certainly, or any of the Jovian moons. And if we discover that this planet is as habitable as we think it might be, it's a lot more accessible than most people think. 
Proxima Centauri was accessible half a century ago with Orion, and even now we could theoretically be looking at scouting out the Proxima system with something like Breakthrough Starshot, with the objective of ultimately building a Pulsar Fusion interstellar ship to get there with human beings in the long run. All of these things are within our capability with technology that we produce right now. Now, of course, many would argue that we need to focus on getting to the moon first or getting to Mars first. And given the amount of very useful materials that we could exploit on the moon, which could then be used to build interstellar ships, I totally agree. But if we discover that there is something similar to an Earth twin uh, orbiting a star only a few light years away, isn't it worth putting most of our effort into reaching that, as opposed to planets that are either long dead or very difficult to terraform? In my opinion, we should seriously look at that. Thank you very much for watching this thousandth episode of The Angry Astronaut. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space.